six. Yeah. You are, you are growing. Yeah. So we are we are just growing. So I think welcome to uh, uh, today's and uh, a very auspicious day. In the Indian sense, this is a very auspicious time. I think in the global sense, this is also a auspicious time. Uh, this is a time of Easter. Uh, this is a time of uh, Chaiti, uh, what we call the Sankranti, uh, the movement of the sun towards the northern hemisphere. Everything is very pious. Almost every day, uh, there is a festival happening in different corners of India, whether it's Annapurna Puja or Ram Navami or Vasanti Puja or the movement of the circuit, what we call Charak Sankranti, which is in a few days. And then we have the Punjabi and the Bengali New Year, which is on the 15th of April. So, uh, so this is absolutely an auspicious time, a very auspicious day. And we are very honored to have a person amongst us who is absolutely global and local at the same time. I think he has his two legs on the two sides of Atlantic, which is Austria and Canada. And he also has his brain and heart on the two sides of the Caucasus, which is again Austria and India. And uh, he has really contributed uh, to a new thought movement in modern architecture. At the same time, He's also into the deep ethos of Indian epistemology and Indian ontology with a very deep training in Raj Yoga and also his association with the, with the primary or the prior Vedic roots, uh, which has deep connection with Vastu Vidya. So it's really a pleasure and an honor to introduce Dr. Michael Karasurish, who is actually uh, one of the leading exponents of architecture in, in the Indian profession and academics right now. I'll just read out a small brief. After graduating with a diploma in architectural technology from the British Columbia Institute of Technology, which is BCIT in Vancouver, uh, uh, he had been working on many projects and he took up his professional education at the University of Oregon. And then finally, he came close to one of the institutes where uh, different people in this forum, like Sunny Bansal, Vedu Bansal, and I personally had been involved with uh, through a project, Varanasi, which is Columbia University's GSAP, Graduate School of Architecture, uh, Planning, and other, other areas. He has worked in Vancouver for a long time. Los Angeles has been the other city in Vienna, in Hamburg, and also in Venice. He worked in the architectural community of Vienna for some time, including Hans Solain, Coop Himmelblau, Ringel Lehner, and many others. These are just to name a few. And finally, returning to Manhattan, to New York City, to work with Ralph Applebaum Associates designing museums. You know, this is a very, very interesting area. Uh, Professor Karasurish is licensed to practice architecture in New York State as well as in India. So he's a very special person. And he's a member of the AIA, which is the American Institute of Architects, the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, which is RAIC, a very prestigious organization called ISOCUP, which is the International Society of City and Regional Planners, of which I am also a member. And so I feel honored to be with Michael on that forum. Mm -hmm. I've been to several ISOCUP and the platforms and uh, you know, and listening to people like Charles Landry and others. And uh, finally, Ma Michael is also associated with the Architectural Culture and Spirituality Forum. And this is very interesting and very important. So Michael has focused on research for about 15 years or even more, completing his doctorate, the goal in architecture, the goal in architecture, which is a very important topic, researched at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna on the basis of the work previously, which began at the SMSF facility at Bangalore. Since completing his doctorate, he has been teaching in India and continuing his research on new grounds for meaning and for importance of being an architect to evolve beyond today's form of professional practice through the unity of architecture and the very larger context of humanity, which is spirituality, just not as a philosophy, but as a practice, as a living philosophy, as a, as a way 
we bridge, as a way we talk, as a way we design, and as a way we deal with the clients at the larger humanity. And as I told you right at the outset, he has focused extensively, which is his inner passion on Raja Yoga, uh, the systems of yoga, which was introduced by Swami Vivekananda in the West, particularly in France in 1806. And he also works with its antecedent Vedic roots along with the long lasting tradition of Indian architectural sciences, which we call the Sthapatya Vastavidya. So we're very honored once again to say that we have Professor Michael Karishevich, uh, our dear Michael amongst us to share some of his uh, deep thoughts and pointers and guidances which we may follow at our new center of excellence of in Indian knowledge systems at IIT Kharagpur. So it's over to Michael and we are looking forward to a very exciting deliberation. So this will be something like an hour and then we can, then we can have uh, maybe uh, a few rounds of questions and answers after that. Thank you so much. Over Thank to you. Michael. Thank you very much for that. Uh wonderful introduction. Uh, that was one of the nicest I've heard. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, the institution that you're building there is, uh, I'm just amazed that I came to it, you know, how out of all the, the huge haystack that we have, there it is, the needle. Of course, it's becoming bigger. You know, it's not just a needle, but um, I'm really glad to be part of this. And, uh, you know, that building in the picture behind me is so significant. Um, and it's just a kind of an amazing poetic thing that this, your effort is, is centered on this, uh, in this building, in that architecture, symbolically, it's amazing. So I uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, this talk is, uh, I've decided to take a little bit of a, uh, risk. I'm, I'm pushing on the, my own envelope in doing this, uh, trying to put things together in a way that I haven't had the opportunity to do. Um, a lot of it, it's entirely based in the Indian knowledge systems and Indian architectural knowledge system. I'm going to avoid saying IKS and IAKS. I'm going to say the full words, you know, I prefer, I, but I might slip once in a while. So I'm trying to put it together. Um, and in a way that's consistent with my research and with the next steps that are coming up. But the real key, as the title says, is that I want to um, talk about what in, in the Indian knowledge systems um, will be able to um, illuminate what we have to do as a next step in architecture. So that, that, is, that is really what I'm sticking to. So I'm going to try and run my, um, my PDF on this, I'm not going to do the PPT. I'm going to try the PDF um, and ask, how does that look? Uh, let's see. Can I shift page? Is it working for you? Am I able to shift uh, slides? Yeah, it's working. It's working. Okay, can shift yeah. the it's you're able to see the slide shift. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. We, we can see. Yeah, yeah. We're good. Great. And uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce Professor Shomesh Kumar. And Professor Shailendra Varshney from IIT Kharagpur, very senior professors, uh, Hello. To, be here, to be here uh, in this presentation. Yeah, thank it's you. Over, thank it's you over coming. to you. It's over to you, Michael. Yeah. So, okay. Um, well, I'm just going to go into this. I'm working, I'm working both uh, reading some of my text, uh, which I've written, and some of the things I'm going to just speak to um, as it comes up. Okay, so I'm gonna try a combination here. That's part of the experiment. So um, I'm gonna call something the setup here, kind of, to give the terms by which, for, around which I'm speaking. So the session is on the future of what I call the currently relatively ineffectual contemporary architectural professional associations and practicing members globally and in India. Like I'm seeing the problem is both global and that global problem is also in India. The issue, let's say, which is, um, I've been watching it for, you know, my career is over 40 years long now. 
So I've been watching it for a long time and I, I think that there's an issue going on that's very serious. Um, but at the same time, we've been living with it for so long, it's not really serious. The means for this future are implied by Indian knowledge system or by the Indian architectural knowledge system that we have and other indigenous value systems as um, uh, Professor Joy might have seen um, uh, when we had our symposium that North American indigenous ideas about the land and about culture somehow are surprisingly similar, but not in sophisticated in the same way that Indian knowledge systems are. Um, so my approach is going to be covering, not particularly in this order, but sort of in this order, I'm going to be covering um, the session focus is focusing on practice, on experience and on experiment of the architectural practicant. Um, we're outlining how yoga and particularly Raja Yoga is related to architectural practice and its, and its Indian knowledge system components of yoga or Raja Yoga and Vastu Vidya. The knowledge we need depends, needs to be re, um, retrieved. So one of the points we're taking is that the knowledge it's all fine to talk about the knowledge that we have and we have the records and we have documentation, but in so many ways, we're at a stage where we have to retrieve knowledge that already was prominent in humanity. And also we have to find the untapped capacity we have inside ourselves in a new way. Um, we're putting light on how the Indian knowledge system component for architecture may enliven in contemporary practice. And this can be relevant globally by the same mechanism that Indian architecture is now so influenced by global systems. It's actually very much part of the global family for better or for worse, right? Um, um, and then uh, that the Raja Yoga and Vastu can illuminate the wider aspects of the Indian knowledge system in architectures, that architecture can benefit from things that have to do with, you know, the skies above us and the, the medicine and all of the other things that are there. It's not just about yoga and vastu, but I'm focusing on these two now. And the last one is that we are in a need, we have a need to reveal what architecture is. And even that question of revealing what architecture is um, needs very careful terms, very special presentation, because it's something that people you know, because of the path we've gone down, it's very hard to see um, a certain concealment that has been going on for a very long time. So uh, that that's kind of what I'm working with. So we're starting now. This this is the first part of our of this talk is is about kind of like the the context continuing. So practice beyond our histories, and that our history our our histories now talk about performance, methodology, and historically prescriptive forms. The objective fact-based histories have their use, but they do not tell us how to achieve a goal. To represent importance and qualities does not get us those values, meaning that we can talk about what happened, we can describe things, but we still haven't achieved. We only know sort of in this superficial way, which relates to, um, also, in Indian knowledge systems, there's a difference between knowledge, which is learned in one way, and knowledge, which has actually become integral to our being. So we're talking about practice. In architecture, we have no lack of histories. They're based in many ideologies through the 18th century onward. We're mainly focusing on those ones. And these are mostly Western histories or Western-orientated histories or histories done in a Western historiological way. Um, their character is from massive quasi-philosophical works, which are still being propagated very much in the architecture schools and in architecture in Europe. And then we have more contemporary works, which are uh, not really manifestos, but they're, these two both have a quality of manifesto, and, and they're very usable, very workable. We also have the work of Charles Jenks in defining postmodernism. And then we have the work of the famous, the famous people, Mies van der Rohe's life work, Elisvitsky, Molinage, which was sanctioned through the Bauhaus, Frank Lloyd Wright by Taliesin. And I put in Peter Eisenman because 
it's his hubris, his love of being there and his love of talking about his work, which really put him, put his work in the front for better or for worse. I mean, a lot of us don't even know what he did and what he pioneered. Um, but all of these people have been what architecture is about. Um, we also have sort of neo or post theoretical manifestos such as, as, such as um, uh, Cole House or OMA is doing. All of these things are providing us information about architecture, but there's some parts of what architecture is about which are not being questioned. In India, we have the greats of the first generation post-independence, uh, Kandinde, Raje, Korea, and so many more who have kind of brought India forward. Um, and their work is represented in much the same way. You know, we look at their, their, their record, we look at their buildings, um, it's by example. But really going into what architecture is, um, is somehow delineated by the profession without question. So practice itself is not really addressed by any of these, which is, you might think that's crazy. Why am I saying that? These people are practicing, but you'll see. These are either the individual, okay. Um, so the question is through this, through this, how do we access what practice is if this is not actually accessing what practice is? So the history of Indian architecture is slightly different than Western history. It is not a history, but the documents themselves. I'm posing it that way. This is my polemic. It, we're, we've got documents about architecture which are stronger because they exist. There is no such body of work elsewhere as the Shastra about, architect, about, about architecture, the, the, the Shupa Shastra. It is, there is nothing else in the world. The only one that comes close is uh, Vitruvius's work. So P.K. Acharya liked to write that he found amazing parallelity between the architecture of Manasara and the Architectura Libri Dece by Vitruvius. He was, P.K. Acharya was well-meaning, noting the material expression of orders, the scale and proportion were expressed in strikingly similar ways. However, Assessing this from the core values of the Indian knowledge system, the Architectura Libri Decim has nothing like the Manasara to offer. Vitruvius talks, gives honor and ex expresses gratitude toward his god, Caesar. This was a political and cultural mandated expression, although you can also see that he has love and fear for this man and he has met him personally and he feels much gratitude. But the expression of an, an origin, of an ontology of architecture is, is absolutely not there in that book. And the whole structure, the vast implications of, of what is expressed in the architecture of Manasara, even in the translated form, because I am not good at reading Sanskrit, even in the translated form is, is uh, a thousand times more powerful than the uh, book by Vitru by, by the ten books by Vitruvius. Um, so I would say that the the Roman document is legible to us because we are still very much working in that method. All of us, even in India, we're working in a method so we can understand that. And the translation of the architecture of Manasara was done in a way which tries to make it similar and in which a great deal was lost, in my opinion. So um, I would like to talk about these documents as being prescriptive. So if we talk about um, prescription, um, what I mean by that is that the form and the process are presented without explanation. In the one hand, it's for us to, de to, to develop that expression and um, to uh, discover what is meant by all these details. But when you come upon a document which is too old and has too many differences to the similar culture, the work becomes a really incredible forensic exercise that is incredibly difficult to actuate. At the same time, the Manasara for me has an incredible amount of information in it that can be brought forward. 
but I could do it as a scholar and do it for myself and learn things. But my interest is in learning to really tie it to the needs of architecture today, to tie it to the way that um, we're running into trouble as architects within a professional structure. So I'm connecting something which has got a very um, subtle and well-evolved long-term quality with something which seems really mundane is the legal requirements of the profession as it is. But that, that is what I would like to do. So talking a little bit about permanent pra current practice, in light of the problems of practice or any evolutionary process, uh, forces resulting in change in the current profession, there is little movement. The business facet of what architects do, combined with the technical production for which we claim our compensation, have become the measure of architectural services. It is locked into the legal and self-regulatory structures of the profession. These having become more or less definitive as services provided, conceal the preparations for the experience of architecture in environments. Postmodernist architects and the work uh, that they do is often a sly, cynical or clever reversal of giving measure for an architecture of architecture's rigorous concealing and the tropes that maintain that, the professional tropes. So sly would be Hadid and Libeskin. Uh, cynical would be Oma and, and, uh, and uh, Col Rem Kohlhaus, or clever is Eisenman and Herzog de Meuron. They're all kind of doing this kind of presentation of architecture as it's concealing as architecture, which seems really weird, but we'll get there. Um, in a strange way, the apparent superficiality of much of deconstructivist and early classicist postmodernist work, meaning what we normally call postmodern, which is a the uh, work that has classical elements, was as clear a presentation of the issue that we have had that we have had since, due to the hubris of rising Western neoliberal culture and the sudden wealth and fame presented to some of these architects. This development could not be maintained in a serious matter, and we dropped back to a generation of woke but relatively centr uh, centrist modernist work. Um, I've been, I'm going to go to the AI conference in Chicago, and I was struck by using, to use this as an example, that in this conference, there is no real discussion about architecture. And this is not uncommon also when I look at the various conferences available in India, that all of the seminars are essentially about technical modes or ways to run your business. Technical modes and ways to run your business. That's basically the whole that people can talk about. And I'm going to be very interested to go there and see if there's any discussion about the, the actual lifeblood of architects. Um, the already religious character of the profession's adherence to business and technology of building and production process is and reinforced by this kind of um, need to improve the architectural profession through business and technical means. And this is what conceals architecture's worth in the outcomes of architecture's work, architects' work. So I'm kind of focusing in on this technical, technical thing. My doctorate very much worked with the idea of technology as being a concealing force using various influences from Indian knowledge systems um, and their interpreters, as well as uh, using Heidegger, uh, whose work is best on, based on Husserl. The interesting thing about Husserl was that he was actually influenced by Indian knowledge systems to develop what he called phenomenology. And um, I'm just bringing this in here. I didn't want to put it in the talk, but if you read the step-by-step -step process that he wrote out of um, phenomenology in his day, the only difference between an Indian process of, of a sadhana based in yoga is that his goal was to discover things about the world and bring them back. Whereas the sadhana was to end your dependence on this world and move on. So he basically took the method all, took it as a methodology for investigating the world. That's another lecture. Okay. Now I'm going to focus in more on the architectural practice again. Uh, the issues of the past 50 years have not changed much, as I've said. 
This is remarkable considering the absolutely radical change that the means and media we use have gone through. Even 30 years ago, I was using paper and pencil and a calculator, and there were still slide rules in the office. So we've gone through a radical technical change and it has done nothing to change the architectural issues we face. And to show that, I'm gonna take this book here, which is actually from the beginning of my practice, um, this architecture story of practice where Dana Cuff went to some architectural offices in California to investigate their business. And, and this was a doctoral work, a thesis. And she came up with four main points of the discussion of what architecture has to do or what the issues in the office were. And uh, I'm not gonna focus too much on these, but I just wanted to mention them um, that there's the art, the discussion between the myth of the independent architect working alone and the idea that he's work, that we all work in a collective. This is a discussion then, it is discussion now. Decision-making or sense-making, meaning are we problem solvers in a scientific way? Are we, to, you know, do we set a problem and then discover the answers and then make movements according to that? Or is this more about reading an agree, make reaching agreement in a collective context that's inherently social and human and so on? The people may say, well, obviously it's about agreement, agreements, but the fact is that our practice, the profession is based on the first one, on problem solving, and our education is based on problem solving. So the, this has not changed. Design as an art versus business and management it's still a discussion. We have two kinds of architects. Um, obviously, we all know, uh, all architects know about this discussion. And then the generalist and specialist argument, those are also still there. These are just four. And admittedly, they're different in, in India than they are in North America. And in fact, they're different in Europe and they're probably different in China. But um, the basic idea you can see has not changed. So, the answer to this problem is that the issues we face are architectural and they are not technological. Allegorically, while we focus on the stove, the pots, the blender and the energy for cooking, the food has been overlooked. We think that if we get better stove, better pots, better blender, increasing the technological force of our energy and so on, that the food will somehow get better. Obviously the food won't get better, but architecturally we think it will or at least that is the position that we have in our professional polemic, in our professional actions, that's how it's set up. Technological advancement, or maybe just technological change, has not touched the need within the realm of what architecture is, what it does for us and how we provide it. This is a proof. Although every, the architectural profession is plowing ahead, with the typical methodology, which I just showed you at A22, it's actually clearly evident that it's not working. The well being of both architects and the well being provided by our environments is poor to terrible compared to what it could be. This is in part due to the limitations put on practice by the profession and its education, as well as low social standing of architecture in practice. Given the amount of reserves, resources spent on building, the resources given toward architectural environments shows values heavily prejudiced against us. Architects are not stepping up to anything near to architects' importance. This is what happens then if the knowledge is used in architectural practice and used to form professional associations is categorically external to scientific and technological knowledge. So the issue is that architecture is not able to function or improve that way. Um, the Indian profession is currently modeled on Western modes, based mainly British in practice, but North American practice and the results are just as much of an influence. This means that the profession is indigenous to India only in terms of who runs the system, making the choices. While its leadership is Indian, it is not founded on Indian values. Although there are specific issues that make the Indian architectural profession work in a specific way to this place, this culture and society, it is based on a model founded on Western values. It is not representative of the Indian knowledge system. The profession bears the Indian society like an architectural project and the Indian culture and knowledge is represented in, as a program only. So Indian architects are part of the global problem that architecture is undervalued, underrated, architects are underpaid and the education is generally inadequate. 
expectations are low. And this is not only an Indian issue, as I've said. Uh, I recently wrote to a colleague in Canada, I am seeking a change in the profession that will define what only an architect does. That will be the light toward which we go and others will derive the benefit. I have come to the conclusion that in many, if not most cases, this will actually require a shift in what practicing architects do. This is, not in, tune, this is in tune with the current situation that humanity will have to interface with the world and with nature differently as soon as possible. So to architects. So the evolution of architecture in India bears the same flaws as the issues of the profession globally, but there, here in India, there are born, those are born in a buoyant, fast change of post-independence and the sudden stop to the hemorrhaging of wealth and well-being that it brought. Indian knowledge systems can be supported through our common technical scientific habits only in part, but the ground of Indian knowledge systems and Indian architectural knowledge system cannot be supported this way. Architecture itself is not bounded by technology or science, nor are Indian knowledge systems, at least not how the word science is commonly taken today. So how do we remember the ground of Indian knowledge systems? What is the actual idea that, that is at the heart of it all? The yoga within, that's what I would propose. The yoga within is the heart of Indian knowledge systems. So now I'm coming to the main content of this talk. That was, that was all my preface or context setting and uh, hopefully I wasn't too, too much of a browbeat, but uh, I'm trying to kind of locate us in a position where it's pretty undeniable that we can do more with architecture than we're doing, okay? So um, I want to speak about um, <clears throat> architecture by putting it in context with consciousness. So, uh, I would say the first siblings or even twins born of human consciousness are, are dwelling within and dwelling without. What I mean by that is that when I become a conscious person, I say to myself, oh, you know, I have feelings. I am seeing something. Before, I just, you know, if a, if a, if a, a tiger came to attack me and eat me, I might have felt, I felt wonder. I felt part of the world. I felt existence. But now I feel fear. I ask myself, what could I have done? I feel that my life might be ended too soon and I had other things to do. And all of these other levels come in, which create the inner idea. And then at a more subtle level, there's the question of what am I or what am I not? This is the inner work. But at this very same moment, the idea comes, <clears throat> how could I have made my, my living place better so that the tiger doesn't catch me? Where would I live to be most um, suitable for my well-being, for my family? <clears throat> Sorry. What makes me most comfortable? How can I be more comfortable? What is comfort? These things come at the same time. So I see that when you say the word spirituality in the Western sense, um, that the word architecture is the same. And I would say that if you take dwelling within with aspiration, you get spirituality. Dwelling without, with aspiration, is architecture. So these are not necessarily equal and completely symmetrical, just like even two identical twins will have different characters. But in this case, the characteristics of difference are very, very precise. The um, efforts when you have aspiration is pertain to the purpose of dwelling life. And I would make the statement dwelling life supports and serves life that extends beyond dwelling. So moving beyond that, oh, let's see how much I covered here. Inward development and evolution serves to provide the architect that knowledge that allows the work to serve the goals of life. So there's, that's where the asymmetry comes, that the spirituality actually is part of being an architect and knowing about this aspiration of dwelling within is what drives architecture and architecture only serves that other level, which we'll look at later. The Indian knowledge system addresses the needs of well-being and consciousness from its beginning. This is the core value of what we have in life as it is what continues to grow and evolve across lives and time, which the Indian knowledge systems accept. I will repeat and cover this more extensively later. The Indian knowledge systems has components for spirituality or spiritual practice, while all of it 
remembers the vital purpose of life in consciousness is some higher condition that it aspires. I will assert that this represents its core and ground. It is founded on defining, expressing, and methodologies to attain the potential that human consciousness grants us. The Gita, the Manasara, the Puranas, the Vedas, and on and on, and also all the commentaries that have come, hundreds of commentaries. They are a legacy that allows a full forensic investigation of what this can be. It is a treasure trove. Thousands of people are studying this formally, millions as a beloved personal imperative or pastime. So now for myself, I am no scholar in that yet. I learned a lot of Sanskrit at the beginning, but I have not maintained my knowledge in that um, or grown it significantly, but I want to. It's one of my, the things I really like to do, but I have not done it as much as I would like. I discovered and entered into this quite late in my life. I'm an architect and work from that facet. My entry point, however, is as a practicant of Raja Yoga, not as an architect. Thus the approach here is through experience, experience of Raja Yogic evolutionary practice, however much I've been blessed to evolve and professional practice of architecture. I practice Sajmar. It is within the movement now called heartfulness. My guide is Kamlesh Patel, a current representative who has taken up the tasks from Puja Sri Parthasarati Rajagopalachari Maharaj, and also the president of the Sri Ramachandra Mission. That institution is named after the founder of the institution and the Adiguru, who both happen to have the same name. Professionally, I have practiced under the rules of the North American profession, and I have substantial experience with Austrian architectural profession, and I'm aware of the limits and freedoms that those have. So. Um, I would like now to talk a little bit about my view of yoga and Raj Yoga um, and then go into how it disconnects with this need in architecture to turn away from these systems that have uh, become embedded for a few hundred years. So these are some of the practices that belong to the Indian knowledge system for evolving consciousness. Um, those are the ones that have influenced me most directly um, in my studies. Um, these are some of the people who are represented by those um, abstract names who have been um, icons over time. And uh, the size of the picture is not relevant to their importance. Um, and then here I would like to show a diagram of yoga that I have used and like to use which kind of shows you a scope. And there's a few observations I made on this diagram. On the first level where you have Viveka, Vairaga, Shat Sampati and Mumukshutva, you see that there's only one trail leading down from Shat Sampati. There are at least as much in terms of practice for all four. And then the Shat Sampati is only expanded in this diagram in two points under Shama and Dhamma. There are four more. So you can see that the field of what can be done and how the interaction can be is vast. And um, I'm happy to be comfortable focusing only on the Ashtanga because, I, and, but that's also a very interesting factor that you can complete what the work is for yoga from any point. Any point contains all the points, which is I'm sure something that uh, Dr. Joy could talk to quite well. Um, that, that, um, that there's the whole is in all the parts. In every of the parts, the whole is there. So I like to point out, for example, you all know this, that, uh, that Gandhi was on the outside. He portrayed the yama into the world. And that was his, his functional methodology very clearly in the way he operated in the world. But in his personal life, in his private life, niyama was very, very much part of his existence. So when you read the books about his life and the, I mean, the book about his life, the one book, that main one, which is all the articles that he actually published publicly, you'll see that these terms of Niyama are his, his, his personal life and the actual way that he works. And I'm sure that you could go on with the other aspects of the Ashtanga as well, that he had all of those. But I really uh, found that the first two are so definitive in, in a, a definitively expressed in his life and um, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Now, the Raj Yoga, as far as I understand it, and as far as it has been kind of developing over the last hundred years, 
since Vivekananda, to me, Vivekananda made the name um, more uh, well known, especially through his book. Um, these uh, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi are the aspect of Raj Yoga that, that I am referring to, and that the goal of Raj Yoga is the Samadhi, which is to have a permanent condition of this original balance. And um, I am familiar with the Yoga Sutra's portrayal, which has this kind of stone-like condition or the consciousness within an unconscious state where you're kind of absent from the world um, is the one way that it could be read. That is one way it can be interpreted. And the last one is when it becomes so endemic to your life, when it becomes so much part of your life, this Samadhi condition, the original condition, that it actually becomes, it becomes a normal life again. You are not, you are not uh, visibly um, hampered in anything that you do. You continue in your life no matter what your elevation is. And so I, I, I would suppose that Vivekananda is a good example of that, fully functioning, but fully in Samadhi at all times. So going further into it, I'm just gonna focus on these first four uh, sutras um, I'm using two translations, Deshpande and Vivekananda, because it's always good to triangulate between the two. Um, and now the discipline of yoga. Yoga is the state of being in which the ideational choice-making movement of the mind slows down and comes to a stop. Then the seer gets established in his existential identity in all other states of being, identification, and the ideational choice-making movement reigns supreme. Triangulating, now concentration is explained. Yoga is restraining, restraining the mind stuff, chitta, and taking various forms, rittis. At that time, the time of concentration, the seer rests in his own unmodified state. At other times, other than the unmodified state, the seer is identified with the modifications. This is something that I, I found those words of modified and unmodified, a reversal that the common condition of humanity right now is a modified condition, and it has been for thousands of years. And what we're looking for is an unmodified condition, an unmodified state. And it's not a pre-conscious state, it's a further state, it's a future state. And perhaps at some point, all of humanity will have this unmodified state. That is the goal. We've been listening to these lessons for 2000 years now, almost, and we're, and these lessons are not new 2000 years ago. They were there before then. They could be 10,000 years old. So this is one thing that I would like to take forward and I'll, I'll be uh, reading some text on that. The other one, which is interesting and important here is just from Sloka two is the, um, this is the Sloka. It's just the one, one word, as you would say, uh, as a non-Sanskrit expert, that the chitta is the scene and the experience, the things that we have in our history, that, which is instantly there, everything we experience is instantly the past, and that we choose what we think is important. And the third aspect of that experience in the choosing becomes what we think, what we feel, and ultimately what we are. And the yoga is the idea of stopping that. Yoga is the idea of ending that. You can have stopping or you can have restraining as a word, but actually it actually says both. The, the translation of the word, at least taken from Deshpande, is to both to slow down and to stop, slowing down and stopping. But um, as we'll see later, um, uh, Krishnamurti takes a slightly more absolutist view of this. So the Yoga Sutra makes clear a clear statement of purpose. The first sutra is the first chapter states that yoga is a cessation of ordinary functioning of the mind. Ordinary being what everybody has these days, I suppose. Although you could say the unmodified mind is ordinary. And what we're doing now is non-ordinary. So you can think about it both ways. The Yoga, yoga Sutra of Patanjali is a primary antecedent of Raja Yoga and the, is instructions on dealing with thought and the mind. Thought is orientated in the Yoga Sutra to the practical work of getting to a more valuable personal condition as it is in the practice of Raja Yoga. The Yoga Sutra expresses control of modification of mind, which is terminology that Yoga, Yoga Nanda, uh, Vivekananda used. 
to provide thought as means that are eventually left behind for their evolved form. The Yoga Sutra passes no judgment of any choice one might make and does not moralize. The implications of something better coming if such control of thought is applied. At the beginning, we don't know what that better thing is. The Yoga Sutra is a description of a set of facts that may be verified individually by testing them, but it is not a practice. The thought of the modified mind or content formed awareness has held sway for a very long period of time. As I was just saying, it's been 10,000 years. It may be since the advent of our current form of consciousness that this problem has been there. The vast multiplication of individual human intents and the production of its objects make the necessity for control of the modified mind's applications as unavoidable as thought and its modifying effect is in the first place. But this is also quite easy to ignore within the vast creation of thought content, its formation of character and awareness. The need to handle the complexity of thought itself is manifested in the same granted capacity of consciousness. To conceive of betterment as originally allowed by the creative impulses of consciousness that all of us use from the beginning. The issues that modifications of mind bring about include the need for solution and resolution that may take the form of ambition and includes the intentional environments we fabricate, meaning the built world. We struggle for discipline with modified mind that utilizes these great powers of thought that may develop into disease. This is based on that original opportunity that we have. Raja Yoga applies a practice for attaining the opportunity for evolutionary transformation through unmodifying mind. After describing many powers that can be attained for worldly ends whereby the modifications were referred to at the start are only controlled for utilization rather than to transcend them, the Yoga Sutra states that such powers are useless for meaningful attainments and ruinous to the seeker of a transcendent goal. Increase of material power and subtle powers beyond sensible methods for manipulating matter endanger well being with all matter of disfigurement and diversions and do not address the need or goal of dwelling. This directly implicates contemporary cultures. We are diverted and disfigured with disease. We assume this is true now. It is the tensions of this and its conflicts that professional practice is formed of. That is why the practice itself does not face what architecture really is. This conflict is the meaning, however, the, is the means, however, by which we can access, ac sorry, by which we can access <laughs> benefit for utilizing spiritual practice to gain control and supersede this stage of architecture. Architecture, not aspiration or human condition. Which one is it? It is a human nature to generally perceive our life quality at the scale of comparing with neighbors or one's community. Misery is hard to perceive if it extends across humanity and longer spans of time. We are unaware of general human misery, even if it affects our own lives. As such, what is misery? We may be able to feel it only as conflict in personal need and as desires. There is little readiness to address what ills there might be because it is too easy to divert oneself with our granted adaptability. It is difficult for the wealthy and secure to realize how their life factors may harm others. If they do, will it be terrifying? It may be too easy to ignore for the profit and ideals of narrow personal well being kept steadfastly in view. This is why our system hardly improves. Despite their being a great deal of pining for the betterment of life, it is the resolve for change that questions all the misery that is lacking. The architect confronts this conflict in the development of every project, but we don't face it because we talk about technology. Raja Yoga's purpose is beyond attachment to life, which gives a role to striving wherein the tool, which is thought waves, is the lower condition that is controlled and eventually superseded for an evolved condition. Developing control of the modified mind and his thought is a first step. Conflict is not essential to dwelling, but is to this period as it is to its end. An approach through spirituality via Raja, Raja Yoga is developing capacity based on health, as is architecture. Architecture joins with spirituality in this way. The other approach, which is a, this discussion between Krishnamurti and Bohm, which is actually the 
a very small book of three of their discussions, which is ex excluded from the ending of time, was what where my doctorate actually began. I found this strange little book in, in Bangalore in a bookstore. Dr. Bohm says the brain is evolved, so it has time within it. It has become part of its very structure. However, the mind operates without time, although the brain is not able to do so. Although the brain is not able to do so. I see that the brain having structured, having a structure of time is not able to respond properly to mind. Then Krishnamurti says, has the brain the capacity to see in what it is doing now, being caught in time, that it, in that process, there is no end to conflict. That means, is there a part of the brain which is not of time? That would mean there's a part of the brain that is free of time. Not a part, but rather that the brain is mainly dominated by time. Although that doesn't necessarily mean it couldn't shift. Yes, that is, can the brain dominated by time not be subservient to it? In that moment, it comes out of time. It is dominated only when you give it time. Thought that takes time is dominated, but anything fast enough is not dominated. So as with, is common with Krishnamurti, these things become really molecular and complex. But the basic problem here is that they're saying that the brain has evolved to not accept the instantaneity, instantaneity of the mind and the heart and its knowledge. The brain has tried to take over thinking with thinking from the knowledge that is there. So then you see this, this immediate connection to what was being implied in the Yoga Sutra that we have an unmodified mind. And what Krishnamurti is saying, the unmodified mind is instantaneously close to us. You cannot reason or rationalize your way out of our situation. You can only stop it. So in going into this, I'm going in areas that are seemingly far from architecture to bring Krishnamurti and, and Bohm's point into a form that serves architectural practice. That thought itself is a form of being that is chosen according to a context of anyone, their individual identity, and also an architect. How are the practice of architectural presencing and the architectural profession tied up in this complexity of thinking and conflict related to thought and psychological time. What he means by psychological time was what I mean by that or what he means, that's his term or their term, is that the, the mind, the brain constructs time, but the mind doesn't have any need of time. It's a construct, it's created. So rather than talking about the unmodified mind and the modified mind as the Yoga Sutra does, Krishna is converting that to talking about the in, implication of, um, of psychological time. With this, in the simple model is to say, well, I see the time passing outside. I see the sun moving in the sky. I see, the, I see trees growing. I see my children growing. <clears throat> Things are taking time. And so we do that inside ourselves as well. We have the idea that things take time inside ourselves. And they're saying this is not, this is a practice, but it's not an absolute rule of how we have to live it's only a practice through thought as this knowledge which act which actually <clears throat> which is actually ignorance in light of indian knowledge systems is interior as time this is not a consideration of right or wrong or moralizing we need to know the necessity for it and its functional role the available the available condition of timelessness barrierlessness and silence which all of us may feel or know in our hearts is always fast enough to remain undominated and immutable, a condition that is in everywhere and always. It always flies on, it is not affected. A structural relationship of architectural practice with spirituality becomes available here. Architectural practice supports the intent that this be revealed and serves aspiration to be that and for that to be in the world, aspiration in dwelling, which we call architecture, is this in terms of our intentional environments. It implies the goal beyond, one that is concealed within the forms of division in mind dominated by time. What they're saying is that when you dominate the mind with time, then you are also creating increments. And those increments take place not only in time, but they take in an incrementalization of all of nature, making all of the divisions, inceptions, separations, and sections that we have, which we're so proud of in our sciences, which we're so proud of in developing our technology. But in fact, it's a construct, as we all know. 
I mean, everybody here probably knows that, but um, what we're trying to do is discuss how exactly that will influence us as architects and then tying that back to the Indian knowledge systems that will then all understand this and work with it, which is outside of the structures that we're working with. This implies a goal beyond, one that is concealed within the forms of division mind dominated by time. When something is built, be it a basic shelter or an urban complex or any intended environment in the world, with purpose of some sort, we are active mentally within nature and within the universe. The ending of time is in this way also a revelation of architecture when architecture's means are conflict as a factor of interiorized time. So technology then, as this incrementalized form of nature is a concealing agent, which in India is also a representative of repressive colonialist structures and cultural modes. And this technology is also the form of the profession, one such structure. I could not say that the COA is a repressive organ of governance as it partakes in this concealing. Institutions are everywhere in this technological form, a version of interiorized time, a manifestation of the modified mind. The amazing factor is that architectural practice suffers under this. Architecture is not conducive to the modified mind. It is experience of aspiration. Indian knowledge systems offer precedence of that, pre and, and, and that predate and understand a wide field of remedying this, but in a form that predates and is antecedent to our current already outdated and harmful approaches. So a lot of what we're getting in Indian knowledge systems from the past is coming in forms that, that um, formed what we have now, which we're already trying to step beyond. So I'm calling this section feeling. Architecture is an experience that relates to aspiration. The aspiration is created within consciousness when we began questioning inwardly and outwardly. The siblings of architecture and spirit, spirituality are both aspiration. We have material intentions, goals and needs, and we have the inner goals. We mix them up so that an outer goal is intended to satisfy my inward sense of well-being, my ego, my ideas about success but we can discriminate those. That is what we call viveka. Aspiration is towards something. That is something that we can choose, but aspiration is ultimately not about choosing. We are all free to choose our goals. I have found that I tend to put high goals in mind and take the attitude of aspiring for them. With that attitude, the idea of a single goal that bears them all come up. So what aspiration covers all the goals we could possibly have? and what aspiration removes choice making. This is a moving target. As we succeed at one target, we move to the next. We discover the terrain as we go along, but we also have the work of our antecedents to guide us, as well as more advanced people with whom we live or who we can access. So I'm gonna bring up the idea of a goal and the idea of a spiritual goal is, has been liberation but it is also merger. It is also an upward trend toward an ultimate, toward unity where nature is bringing multiplicity and spreading out and uh, multiplying all of the effects of whatever comes more and more and more. Spirituality is a goal of turning. And this is one diagram of such a goal system where you go through stages heading toward a singular unified center, the origin merger. We might imagine that at some time in the past, many of us had arrived at the need for such a goal and for it to form an intent to take our consciousness in hand. I believe that the IKS, the Indian knowledge systems are founded in that. And that's why I focus on yoga. And I'm lucky to focus on yoga because the focus on yoga came first. But yoga very clearly talks about the goals and a lot of the other things such as architecture support that goal. What is the goal? This is something that it takes all of us a long time to work with. Another way to look at this whole thing is to think about the body as three parts, which, we're, which you are all probably, or many of you are very familiar with that we have the three sheaths or bodies and the mind, the what we gain in our life now is the one that is mutable. The body can be changed, you know, I can become fat, I can become skinny, I can lose a leg, 
I can even modify my body with certain therapies. But ultimately, it's and there's of, of course there's um, epigenetics where my own lifestyle starts to turn on and turn off genes. So I have a great deal of flexibility in the body. But the body, I'm not a tiger, I'm not a worm, and I'm not a anything else from another planet, such as the creatures that live on, I don't know, Triton or wherever it is. The soul may be mutable. It may be changeable. Tradition says it is not. But what's for sure is that anybody who's talking about it probably hasn't gotten that far that they know anything about it. So it's effectively just that. The soul is that. It is our goal. So the mind is the thing that can be altered. And I've already mentioned manas buddhi and ahankar. Um, one way to think about the manas buddhi and ahankar is to say that the poem that I know, or a little prayer that I know, is may I develop right thinking, right understanding, and an honest approach to life. That covers the three of them. Another way is that manas is called thinking. It's a thinking function, um, which transforms to feeling. Buddhi begins his knowledge, but becomes wisdom. And ahankara is what drives us. I use the word as intent, which is important for later on. The intent is something that Ahankara uses, but it's not intent itself. Um, in spirituality, where intent comes from is often referred to where it comes from. It is commonly called ego, but has many nuances that are hard to define. And ego is not an exact fit for sure. It begins as lust and desire, passes through love and may transcend all the realm of bliss and beyond. The components of aspiration are therefore described better as feelings. And when we talk about, I'm linking aspiration to architecture here. So if we talk about architecture as being like, taking, just taking a little moment here, architecture is buildings. Architecture starts with sticks and mud. This is what we learn in school. And I'm saying architecture is all about feelings. Architecture is about contentment, forbearance and balance coming to terms with desire, calmness and peace, coming to terms with restlessness and hatred, compassion and love, coming to terms with anger, courage and humility, coming to terms with fear and clarity, coming to terms with illusion and attainment. That is what actually drives architecture. So going a little bit deeper into practice, my shampradaya, my belief system, or my practice, it's not a belief system, it's actually a practice, shows a series of chakras, a series of points that can be cleared. They are grantis, they are the knots, they are sub knots, there are billions of knots in the body, and these are knots that can be dealt with. And I took those resolution points here as being from these five points, which comprise the region of humanness, the region of the heart, and can be taken on one by each depending on how blessed we are, it's faster and slower, that there's a way to practice so that we resolve the dualities in each point. This success here takes you far beyond liberation. This is not about the traditional idea of liberation. Um, there are a series of points which are seen, which can be used in this practice. So this is one form of practice, one that I am involved in. Um, and they have qualities at each point. And points, the sixth point, the Ajna Chakra, everybody knows it. So I put that one up here. It has these qualities. Now, you have to imagine that architecture is actually given its ultimate meaning, the one that transcends thousands of years and across any culture by being human, not by context. It's by being human. So if we want to get to the root of architecture and understand that it comes from the point of consciousness aspiring, then these things can meet. That is my proposal. And this is where um, the Indian knowledge system and the Indian architectural knowledge system overlap and can begin to um, evolve together. Another point, point six and seven is actually the Ajna chakra and point seven is right nearby and the Chit Lake is just behind it. And so many other, it's a very intense point, this one, then it goes on through the circles of egotism or the ankara to the 10th point. And then you come to the realm of Prabhu and you move nearer and nearer to complete merger. 
it's God or whatever you want to call it. We can also look at structures for aspiration, the inspiration for intent. We can look at those. I wanna stress here that these are intended, all of this stuff that I just talked about is intended as a means to, complement, uh, to, to comprehend for the purposes of communication. So maybe that's my Western mind thinking. You know, I was very impressed with uh, um, Dr. Sambit, that's how I was talking about Shampradaya, that you can have absolutely opposing of schools, even in one person, and go forward with a sense of hope and aspiration, even as they seem to be conflicting. So I'm trying to present this as a way to communicate, and it may conflict with some people's ideas. And I know people take their spirituality and their approaches very, very seriously. But um, I'm presenting this as a way to understand all of that um, for the purposes of communicating and for the purposes of moving together in unity as architects who understand that mud and sticks is not architecture, it's human experience. Human experience, if you take the simple triangle of bhakti, karma, and jnana, then you have human experience where it starts at the bottom plane of the triangle, which is not necessarily an uh, equilateral triangle, where we normally live. And in that zone, you have freedom of choice. And I've taken the line of duty and aspiration, freedom of choice. Let's look at it this way. If you have freedom of choice, you don't have anything until you choose something because freedom of choice doesn't give you anything except when you choose something. When you choose something, you don't have choice anymore. Then you have a duty. So there's a, that bottom line has a vertical element, which is very, um, in a certain sense, absolute. And it leads to the idea of aspiration once you've chosen something and when you decide to go for whatever you need to go for. And that leads to love, devotion, and eventually unity and merger. And it's an infinite path. So structuring it a little bit differently or taking this structure a little bit differently, if we take that line of taking an intention forward and say it's a positive evolutionary growth then I would call the one side is the private, is the public sphere and private space, public and private space, the place you live, the place you personally exist. And the other aspect is the public sphere. Um, this is a, a small, uh, I'm going to just make it small here. It's its own subject. But if you know about the public sphere and the way Jurgen Habermas developed it as being some sort of a social uh, development of, of, the, um, of the individual, I'll show you that later. But the point here is that this, this diagram actually is, leads to nishkam karma, where you're transitioning from the choices you have and reveling in all the choices to realizing not only duty, but actually that you have to, that there is choicelessness. That choicelessness begins to arise um, as you move toward your goal. Choicelessness happens. And it has related to dwelling's purpose. And if it's not related to dwelling's purpose, well, you fall down again and you have to start again. Public sphere, I've got a whole branch of study that has to do with the public sphere. Um, I've only written two articles and the articles I've written, I've sent to architects and not to social scientists and such. So the response has not been very impressive. But if you talk about the public, the, the, an individual person, a monad, one of us is the blue ball. And if each of us, there's thousands, there's billions of these blue balls and each of the blue balls has a private space in principle. In principle, it has a private space. And intention and identity relates to our chit, to our expansion, to our knowledge, to our development. And the billions of people who are developing this, this uh, knowledge, this evolution, creates the sphere of the public sphere. That's the sphere we're in, we're working. And I believe that that sphere is the working sphere of architecture. That is where we work. That is what architecture gives measure to, is the public sphere. It gives measure to our aspirations, which are formed with intention and identity. And I know that you can think of all of the, the Sanskrit words that would relate to this and the, 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 the way that this comes out of the Indian knowledge systems. 
Unfortunately, as I said, I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, so I've converted it to an English form. So now I'd like to move to architecture. Given all of this now, I would like to move to architecture and my go-to document, which is the Manasara, and discuss four things that are really important that cannot be replaced anywhere else. They're not anywhere else. And, and as much as you may have problems with the form, or a Westerner may have problems with the form that this is given, there is no way that you can deny that its intention can be expanded and unpacked, or whatever term you want to use to, to talk about um, what the real importance of being an architect is. And this, this is a really, I mean, I have taken this on as a really heartfelt um, essence that we can understand what is, what is happening now by as well. <clears throat> So you probably, um, many of you know that this, the, the Manasara structures it and says that the, that the architect is descended from the four faces of Brahm. And that um, there is um, through, through you know, the, the, the joining of, of uh, uh, couples and then finally you come to the architects, the four architects with the Shtapati Shtapati, the Vardhaki, uh, the Shutragrahin, and the Takshaka. There's the four architects. They're architects. There's not the architect and the guys who help him or her. They're the architects. And um, this is a really interesting concept. In our schools right now, we are teaching draftsmen or the Sutragrahin, and we're teaching the Vardhaka, Vardhaki. We're teaching those two. We don't aspire very well to teaching a shtapati. We don't aspire very well. The architectural profession does not really support the shtapati, the one who, and, and, and in certain ways it's considered an arrogance to be such a person. But really the greatest architects that we know and some of the pictures I showed you earlier of architects that we know, they were shtapatis and oftentimes they didn't finish school. They didn't even go, some of them. They just dropped out because they couldn't handle it because it wasn't teaching them what they already knew was true. So the origin of architects that is in the Manasara is really essential and can be developed and studied to show us what we need to do so I'm very much. And I can go into more details about how that relates to yoga, but I think we'll see that as I go through the other steps here. So the next one, rather than the measure and proportion, I would like to call it vibration. When I was starting with this many years ago, I was trying to figure out the measure system. I did a lot of fiddling around with proportions, I mean, with the numbers. Um, and as we all know, the Manasara or the, the Shopa Shastra does not have a set standard measurement system. Why would they need it? They had no factories. Every house, every building was done here and now by these people. So the, develop, so the measurement system was based on proportion and progression, and it wasn't based on a fixed number. Um, it's very hard to understand how to use those numbers for somebody before all of a sudden your mind kind of goes into the space and says, wait, it's not about a fixed dimension. So the tall circle is the proportion system that they use. And the right-hand oval is the kishku, which is also called the cubit, which is also called the yard or also called the meter. It relates to all of those dimensions, although the, the difference in sizes are very different. Um, the idea of it being the forearm is common across many cultures. So here it's quite small, the way I've given it numbers, but uh, the numbers aren't really as important as its location in the world. So this is what you get from the system in the book when you look at these pages that, that you can look at. I mean, the pages are... And then I found this diagram of the, of the um, opacity of the atmosphere. Now here, I'm gonna take a real leap. You're gonna, you may, some of you will like this. What I did is I overlaid the rough dimensions of these, uh, these measurements in the Manasara and then with, with the atmospheric opacity and the vibration, the electromagnetic vibrations 
that pass through the atmosphere. You can see on the left, the rainbow, you can see there that almost all of visible light passes through. So we have evolved as human beings to see that. That's our visible light. We can see that. Now, there are other wavelengths that pass all the way through the atmosphere as well, which, and the terrestrial radio is absolutely transparent, right? The atmosphere is transparent to terrestrial radio. Well, if you look at that slight, the gray bar that coincides with where the atmosphere is completely transparent to radio waves, you can see that that's the same dimensional vibration. The dimensions of the electromagnetic vibration are the same as the dimensions of the sound that we can hear. Is that a coincidence? And then the thick gray lines, the triple thick gray line is the kishku. It's the, it's the qubit, it's the forearm, the human forearm is directly in the middle of that. And that space, if you look at the top, it says manipulation space and movement space. That space is also the space of our body. Our bodies are the size of the, the, you know, if you say a room between or spaces between five centimeters and 10 meters is the spaces we live in. All the things we make and do, 99% of them are between five centimeters and 10 meters, right? Or 20 meters. Actually, the line there would break at 20 meters, but it doesn't matter. You understand the point is that the, the measurement system in the Manasara coincides with the vibrational space that is most prolific for us and is harmonized with the size of our bodies. And in fact, all the bodies of creatures on the planet are in this size realm. Now, I don't really know all the significances there, but that overlap for me is profound and that, that the uh, vibration system, you know, the Paramanu is the only one which is completely out of this, you know, in this very small zone, it marks the end of the zone that we can actually deal with, although it was perceived by a seer. Obviously, it's smaller than anybody could ever see. But all of this, you know, creates a harmony, which I think is when we talk about in Western architecture, we talk about aesthetics, we talk about proportion and harmony, and we go back to columns and and you know all of these kind of things. For me, it seems like it's time to think about the actual vibration in a space like the medicine, like the chemistry, when we take medicine, it creates a chemistry in our body, it creates an electromagnetic transformation. The chemistry is electromagnetic. It creates electromagnetic changes in our body chemistry. So similarly, architecture to be most functional would have to deal with this level. And it seems to me that this is about that. And it has not been investigated very much, but this is something that's really profound. And I think that there there are other levels of this. Another one, um, rather than talking about site preparation, I call it asking for permission. The whole text that you have in the Manasara, which talks about the preparation of a site, is, an, is, is about permission. It is about, we could say it's about preparation. We could say it's about, in part, it's about understanding the quality of the ground for, 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 um, for, structural purposes, um, but the, the quality of the ground for structural purposes is actually being understood for the vibration that the ground creates and structural support of the ground and that is solidity is in a certain sense, a secondary aspect, especially when your buildings are very light and made of wood and such things, it, it wouldn't be a critical aspect. You know, We know now that we can build structures in mud and they will stay stable. We have the technology to do so. So ultimately, the architecture was there before, the technology comes, the technology goes, the architecture is there afterward. That architecture is about something else. The very bottom, as you know, that in the Shilpa Shastra, the ground is an architecture. The ground is known as an architecture. And here it says the ground is known as the foundation of all kinds of buildings. Well, I think I would translate that differently. I'm sure it doesn't say all kinds. I think that you could find a better way to translate that. So the interesting thing here is permission. Our, when we come to a site now, we don't ask for permission. We, we don't have any idea about how to get permission to build on a piece of land. In fact, we don't validate that at all. Some of us still do, I mean, in India, everybody does puja. 
at the beginning of a building project, but do they really understand that it's asking for permission or is it just wishing for good luck, right? It's a question of intent here and that the structure that we could develop in architecture of understanding how to get permission, because you know, as people, we have permission from day one. That's not the problem. It's not permission like, can I do this or can't I do this? It's more about respect and harmonizing and integration with the knowledge that the human beings have such power and can ruin everything if they do it wrong. So this is very important. And now the last one, instead of the Purusha Mandala, I would call it nature's functionaries. Here we have a reference to all of the energies, all of the previous people who have gone up and have become functionaries of nature. They're still related to humanity. And you know this thing, I, I just wanted to put it here because it's very important, but I, I don't want to dwell on it for too long because um, I think we're very familiar with that and its importance. Um, and if we combine that with the characteristics and knowing more about the energies and how those energies like Varuna and Ganya and Yama and Agni, how they relate to what we know now about the world, to reintegrate it is something that I'm really interested in. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have a long enough life to do it, but it's really interesting to me. So now I'm going to go to a section where I'm going to actually talk a little bit more. I hope I'm not taking too much time. I don't have enough. Where am I at? I'm almost at four. Oh my well, gosh, you guys. I've been going too long, haven't I? <laughs> it's okay. Maybe around four we can. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, my gosh, that was a fast hour and a half. I hope I haven't been too redundant. Um, no, absolutely not. I think that uh, I will. Okay, I'm going to try and go through this fast. Can I have 10 more minutes? Yeah, sure. 10 more yeah. minutes. Ten okay. Minutes. So I was just going to talk about actual practice right now, which has been, or recent practice, which relates to some of these points. So this is a drawing from Koa Pimbalao. They call it a psychogram. Their way of building was to do this drawing and then never question the sketch and to build it. The idea here was to create an absolute barrier to technology that technology becomes entirely in service of the idea. And they were doing it as an architecture about that, that saying, look at us, we are not going to question our intuition. We are not gonna question our inner idea about this building. And we're gonna make it happen no matter what it looks like. That is what they made their career from. And they built billions of dollars worth of construction. The other one I'd like to talk to is a famous old guy named Frank Gehry. Same thing, sketch, right? Then he has his office and he makes this paper and tape and glue construction and they play around with it. Then he feels that he's accomplished his goal. This is literally what happened. The film is filmed and I've, I've you know, this is a film by uh, uh, Pollock. So he says, yeah, 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 he's so happy. Then they take the model and put it into the computer so they can build it. The filter from the intuitive creation of what needs to be done is one way. There is no feedback from technology. The technology serves the architecture in these two offices. And there's other offices which I could analyze, but it's more complex. These two are clear as day. And so what these guys can do is they can come up with technology that does what it has to to express the feeling. That is really profound for me. That is Viveka. They have discovered the difference between what serves and what is service. They have discovered the difference between their inner need and what has to be done. Kenneth Frampton wrote, cultivate a resistance to identity given culture with discrete this recourse to universal technique. Now I'm talking about this whole idea of the Indian architectural scene. This is called critical regionalism. Universal technique means Western technique. Resistant by adhering to Western technique. So you get somebody who's Ganapati Stapati who shows you an example of a building, which is profound in its expression of Indian forms on basically a Western box. 
giving culture resistant identity based on recourse to Western and modern technique. The other way is you get a drawing like this, by, which was promoted by uh, you know, P.K. Acharya, where's the building where you say, what in the world is that building? How does that work? I call that resilient. Identity giving culture extending outward and rooted in local culture and its antecedents. So I'm gonna skip discussing uh, um, Korea's project and go straight to this diagram, which is the ultimate idea of integrating the Indian knowledge systems with architecture, how all of these parts can work together. And if you'll let me, I can read one page of conclusion and then I'm done, okay? Rather than the structure of buildings and things that hold up gravity and materials and matter, architecture is made of these things as we presence it. This does no more or less than demote building to the support of and means of architecture, but such an action will nullify the terms of practice as for the professional acts. Thus, it is the vibration of material in life that resonates in anyone's experience. Indian architectural knowledge systems is based in this and is in harmony with Indian knowledge systems wholly, which like all of life is in the same base of aspiration for human evolution. The issue is not competition, or opposition to the current professional architecture and its structure. The basis for the profession as it is now, as with the Architectura de Libri Desim, makes no pretense to arise out of architecture's actual ground. It is like a placeholder, a stopgap. The profession's needed change now is essentially to realize its real superordinate program, which the Indian knowledge systems express. Traditional forms of architecture in India express this, but they were as much designed as what we currently understand as vernacular. The coming change is like a wave on the beach that covers the previous wave. Together they are larger, but the new wave is its form. Professional practice of today will not be erased or removed, but it will also not be architectural practice as we know it any longer. The wonder of architecture is that although there are these revolutionary stages of consciousness, they are not required to experience architecture, it seems. Rather, the architecture as our aspiration, which is infinite, already bears all grantis. It bears all knots one might have, whether they are traversed and clarified as yet, or await that in the sadhana, in the sadhana of a life. Architecture is an experience. Architecture people who practice to make environments that serve the experiment that we are all embarked on of using our life to experience our aspiration to evolve fully. This has its mundane material attributes of making people comfortable and giving them that base from which to proceed to their next better condition. The way that the Indian knowledge systems will support the transformation of architectural profession is that it can provide documented awareness of this. It provides for its possibility in so many ways for us to create names, structure and process for a profession providing the real form of architecture. As a start, we are able to see how the profession conceals architecture. And that is architecture about this concealing. We are able to reveal that as architecture of revealing, moving beyond not architecture about its concealing as architecture. That is the basis of postmodernism and deconstructivist architects' work. The profession about architecture today will be integrated with nature, both of the world and nature, that is human consciousness dwelling in its nishkam karma. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. I think this is something, uh, I don't know how to put it. This is something what the world will eventually become a few decades from now, what the humanity will is slowly begin to understand uh, perhaps half a century from now. <laughs> and this is where maybe, yeah, maybe. And this is where uh, all humankind will finally march maybe a hundred years from now, you know, the turnover into the golden age. By golden age, we don't mean ores and ores of gold. What we mean, gold as the quality of human mind, which you have said respect and harmony while we design within and while we design without. And the connection between the spiritual practice in the inner world and the architectural practice, the design of the built environment in the outer world. I'll just make a quick summary and I'm so excited. This is almost like a course material you know, for Indian knowledge systems the special focus on Vastu Vidya, Vastu Shilpa Vidya, Sthapatya Vidya, Nirman Vidya, you know, the various things, mm -hmm. construction yeah. practices, industrial pra practices. But these are not uh, 
workshops that we mean in the modern times. These are actually the training, as you said again and again, the training of the inter inner mind. You started with practice, uh, uh, experiments, and experience in a very, three very important words. And then you had actually connected the inner world and with a very special focus on Raj Yoga on the one hand and the design of the external environment, which is Vastu on the other hand. In fact, what has happened today, everyone knows we are, we are basically in a Cartesian world where we just take care of the external world. You know, We just are driven by the impulses of the external world, but we forget that the external design is actually the implication of what we think inside. If we think inside wrong to begin with, we do wrong things outside to end with, to end with. And this came out so well in your presentation. Uh, this is not one hour uh, stuff, no, chitta stuff. I As told Swami I mentioned that I'm doing yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit of an experiment As to Swami see if Vivek I can traverse that, that, say, yeah. that yeah, This is like, Sorry, a, this I used is like a, no, no, time. it's absolutely beautiful. And some of our uh, uh, Vastu scholars are here like Anurag, Nandini. So they have been hearing you. More important today, there are three uh, IK scholars. I, <coughs> I wish Anurag, Nandini and others, they can turn on their video just for half a minute and show their faces to you and get your blessings. You know, it's very, it's very important. Get your blessings so that uh, you know, Bulton, uh, Bulton is also here, three scholars. You know, so they, they, they get the inspiration from what you say. And, uh, and I think uh, what came out very important eventually in your speech is what is the intent, you know, why, were you, why we are doing all this, you know. So that came out very well in your talk. And especially the connection between uh, uh, the prana, you know, the vital, the, electro, yes. the electromagnetic uh, oscillations that we have inside us, which has a relationship with the electromagnetic oscillation outside us. And, I didn't uh, mention and, that. Yet. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I missed that. Yeah, you you, really you had one slide on that, and I was getting very excited. So that's Anurag, who has just turned on his video. Oh, yeah. I hope you can see him. Yes, I can. Uh, he's one yeah. of a scholar. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm so happy that you have a contact with Michael <coughs> right today. And so this is so important, you know, so important. And this is a connection uh, which you showed uh, in, the, in, the, in the scales, you know, that we use in Vastavid there. The micro scales, the Yaba, the Angushtha, and the Tilaka, and the Dhanur Mishti, and all the things. I mean, you just showed one slide, but you meant, I think that's a very interesting piece of research, which borders on the edges of science and vibrations on the, the science of vibrations on the one hand. Uh, Professor Kumar is here, which is absolute analytics on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is absolutely uh, transpersonal psychology. You know, the works of Maslow, Gregory Bateson, you know, Shombit Datta, you mentioned, yeah. he's absolutely a follower of Gregory Bateson. You know, so Bateson is a very big name in the West right now, who is who has realized Indian knowledge system to a very large extent, to a very large extent. And I think finally, the last diagram that you showed, you know, uh, which is the connection between the microcosm inside and the macrocosm outside is actually, a, it's, it's a lifelong diagram, you know, and this is the training which has to start right from our home days, you know, in, at the hand of our parents, our grandparents, it has to happen through the school, you know, when we design our seat or a particular class and how we deal with our classmates, how we design our school, how we design our school environment, you know, it starts right there. And then how we enter our college environment. I mean, Professor Kumar is a very experienced administrator. How we design our gymkhana. I mean, how does a bunch of students design their interaction with another bunch of students so that they don't end up with something which is not desirable, but they end up with something which is highly desirable. You know, so they, so this right choices are extremely important. So it's just not the question of habitation but it's actually the designing of human habits. So, so I think that the, the beautiful thing that came out from today's talk, I mean, I see it this way, this is my 20 years of discovery. The entire architectural practice is actually the moderation of human habits based on the moderation of human habitation. Yes. So how we design our inner habits. So this is Professor Shailendra Hershne. He's in charge of the Parthokosh School of Academy, the Academy. Oh, I'm right now not the from PGL, so right now I'm an independent yeah. person. Yeah, he's an independent <laughs> person, 
and okay. right now I'm the I'm just from the EC department. Just yeah, he's uh, just so he's from like the to, sir. So he's from the science of vibrations, uh, communication, yes, and, <laughs> and propagation. So we are oh, just yeah. discussing. So it is all his area. And he's really he has a lot of knowledge uh, in you know, in ECG, EP, and yeah. noetic sciences, and the bio neurophysiological right. sciences which edge on electrical sciences. It's so yes. important. It's so important. Architecture connects. To yeah, this is all some resonances within. It's untouched. It's all the know, resonances within interior and exterior. Mm -hmm. So what you talked about, all the resonance in exterior as well as you touched upon with interior as well. So this is nothing is the flow of energy, uh, exterior and interior through this, all the resonances bodies. So the bodies can be your nanometer to the kilometer of dimension, meter of dimensions. So I think I like this uh, a lot your talk and fantastic. And uh, I had just one carry on to your one of the slides uh, where you shown the the spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah, yeah. And uh, would it be possible to share you this slide once again on yeah. the screen? And uh, where you have just shown, okay, uh, when you look in the one meter beyond. And this small text is actually, we couldn't see that small text. I know, text. It's, it's, uh, it's a very... I've had that drawing for a long time and I haven't, I have to upgrade it. Yes. Yeah, so what's mean by when you say onto the human terrestrial radio, or let's say, uh, or when you go into the, let's say longer. So this is a zero kind of like, a, okay, this is, you're talking about opacity. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, the black line is the opacity to yeah. electromagnetic vibrations and it goes down to zero, zero. for this device, which I guess is confirmed by your, you, you know that, right? So. Yes. It's very, very transparent at this level. And it's the only place where it's transparent. Yeah, is the transmission, is the old transmission window. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, how we are going to relate it, it with the, let's say, when you look into the, uh, whether it looks into the yoga or when you look into the, in terms of, let's say, architectural structure, or this is like this window is going to help in well, what terms, the, actually. The, okay. One of the things there's a, I don't know if you know about this, in, but in terms of a kind of a material sciences study, if you take a, a certain dimension of volume and it is not transparent to electromagnetic vibration, okay, it's a, it's, it absorbs it. It is absorbed, um, yeah. The, the vibration that exists inside that space will only be the wavelengths that are harmonious with that dimension, no matter how small yes. they are. They, won't, they won't, simply won't exist inside if they are not harmonious with that dimension. That simple idea is part of what I think would happen in architecture is that when you start designing the spaces themselves, um, you could start from the simple absolute of saying, I have walls which are not transparent to electromagnetic vibration, yes. and they have to be at a distance which gives the best vibration, okay? But then in architecture, you have partial transmission in building sciences, right? You have concrete, you have hybrid materials, you have mixed True. materials. So it becomes extraordinarily complex. The, ma the matrix of possibilities is insane, right? You can't even think it, it's such so complex. Yes. Um, so what we, what we need to do in architecture is at least to start to understand that the space and the dimension and the pacing of our objects in architecture are not merely um, visual. That there's actually a palpable effect on our physical bodies and the resonances that happen. This is inside the Indian architectural knowledge systems. They knew okay. something of it, but they're being 100% prescriptive and non-transparent about where this knowledge came from because it probably just came from experience over thousands of years. Yes. So now in science, we have the ability to study these things much faster. We can make propositions and see how they work. And so this diagram proposes such work. Yeah, and one more slide I'd like to where you mentioned about the heart. It's really very nice one. The, uh, the area shown the heart and then the four the quadrant. Five, of... The five, yes. Well, that, that belongs to the practice of Raj Yoga that I do, which is heartfulness um, based okay. on Sahaj Marg um, practice. Um, it's actually available to anyone. It's free. It's based in India right now, centered either in, in Manapakam in Chennai or at Hyderabad. And um, yeah, this practice so he, starts, he, starts. So here you one. mean like kind of like uh, all these points, like uh, this is like the balance between these points. Uh, how do we understand from here? Okay, point what one the is message what, that we'll take, every, it, take it from here, sir. 
Well, all I'm showing, okay, what I'm showing is that the, the human evolution in spiritual practice is um, essentially one of what we call feelings. Not really emotions, but emotions are tied in with feelings. So as you move through the progression spiritually, you are touching on these things such as courage and fear, anger and love. And these are the things that actually are part of our aspiration as human beings. We intend things and we intend them with courage, with fear, with compassion, with anger, with love, with commitment. We intend it that way. So architecture actually, if I'm saying architecture is not sticks and mud, I'm saying architecture is aspiration. It's realized asp aspiration, realized given measure. We're giving measure to this um, human condition, which is bound up with aspiration. But ask aspirations components are all of these things that we experience, such as courage and fear and calmness yeah. and peace. So there's a direct relationship between a kind of a yogic practice, which takes us step by step by step to evolving our consciousness to a super consciousness and the actual physical things we build in the world that way. And we use bricks and mortar or steel to our benefit or to our demise. And mostly we're building harmful things. 99% of what we build actually requires us to overcome them. But there's an interesting contradiction because if you build something which is extremely harmful, but it excites you because it visually makes you feel powerful, yeah. visually, then you overcome them. You, you know, it's not a simple one plus one uh, you know, relationship. It be, it, consciousness is so powerful that we can overcome things. So we become confused when we talk about this. But this presentation I made tries to hone it down to these essential points, not in a okay. prescriptive way, but as a descriptive communication method. So thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just uh, I wanted to just come in one, just one comment on this. Actually, yeah. uh, I mean, like in our scriptures, we say that the human body is made of these five elements. Uh, these five elements are this earth, fire, water, air, and the ether. Ether means basically you know, the empty space or that kind of thing. Yes. And uh, each of this is connected with, so you have actually very beautifully mentioned it here, like fire, the positive uh, vibration, if you see, then it is compassion and the love. And if it is the negative, then it is the anger. And similarly for water, actually the positive aspect of it is courage and the negative of that is fear and similarly you have mentioned about all of them. So in our scriptures and also in many of our uh, uh, religious writings it is uh, repeatedly mentioned uh, these five uh, elements that are there which actually our body consists of that. So it's really good and uh, you are actually connecting it with the architecture. Yes. I mean I was really very very impressed because architecture somehow we have a feeling that it is actually all bricks and mortars and the drawings and uh, but but it is you have actually brought it to totally another level and uh, that actually show I mean also sort sort of justifies that why the people in the say rural settings are in the village dwellings where they have simple huts and all but the people still live very happily mm -hmm. so that must be the thing because they must be having the positive vibrations and other things uh, if you look at from the modern scientific point of view maybe the building is not according to that but but according to their spiritual or according to their mental health and other things probably that is the best and that is why they may not like to leave that and go somewhere else they will like yes. to live in that particular place mm -hmm. yeah thank you i i think i really enjoyed thank the you. talk and yeah i, I think brought a yes, completely yeah. new perspective yeah absolutely, at least in professor me. Kumar. absolutely absolutely professor kumar and that is why as you said contrastingly some of the Urban dwellings at the dens of suicides and homicides. Yes. Contrast, contrastingly. No? Because we and in villages, that, you don't see. In villages, you don't yeah, see. In villages, you don't see that. Yeah. Well, you know, Actually, there's one, I thing, one thing I could say, which is really uh, counterintuitive, is, you know, if you think about people who live in slums, they have a tin shack or something. They have the ground on their feet and they have the sky above their head. And then you move them into a modern six-story replacement house, they lose the guy, the ground, they lose the sky, they lose their autonomy, they lose the air, no matter how stinking it is, they lose the air, it's no longer their place. It's something that just somehow is never their place. So even there, you see that architecture actually is not touching the need. And, and, um, 
And that's something that you don't even want to say sometimes, like, how can this be true? You know, the slum can't be better. Well, it's not really better. It's just a question of what you're losing, right? So it's the same as the village question. Uh, I, I just wanted to connect you to another scholar of ours. Nandini, are you, are you around? Can you put on your video if it's possible? Anurag already showed it his face. Nandini, are you around? Yeah. yeah. It's okay. I think if she has a problem. So the question to Professor Joyce and sir. Yes. <laughs> sir, uh, if this book is available in here, this Mansara. Yeah, the books are oh, available yeah. here. I, have, I also have a copy. There. And in fact, uh, we, uh, we don't want to open up a Pandora of discussion here, but the- No, I'm just, I just wanted to have like, yeah. uh, let's have a sometimes- No, 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 I'll tell, tell you with, something Come here. to you. Yeah, so. I'll tell you something here because we may not get this opportunity once more because Professor Michael is here, Professor Kumar is here, you are here, uh, electrocommunication expert. Actually, there is a whole area which is yet unexplored. What Professor Kumar said, the five elements composing the five yeah. levels of human consciousness, the five chakras, and what Professor Michael had explained from the other angle and, and had come close to it, are actually the compositional response to stimuli, uh, vibrational, you know, the vibrational modes inside our body. Yes. And yes. they and they are believed to be believed to be. It's a belief. They are believed to be the foundational vibration of our vowels and consonants, and that is the foundation of our Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. That is the beginning of a Sanskrit. So the evolution of Sanskrit over history becomes a, a unscientific question. When, when every human being is born, any human being, whether you are a Hindu or a Christian or, a, or anybody, he's born with this garland of letters, you know, the vowels and the consonants, which are vibrations that interlink. Is all, yeah. They, they interlink the inner world and the outer world. So mm. there is actually a book by John Woodruff, who was a British lawyer. And in, after he came to India, he became a sadhu. And he actually exposed that science. His guru was Shivchandra Vidyanam, who was a classmate of Ishwarchandra Vidyashagar, you know, the, very, the very, very famous Vidyashagar that we know from Midnapur. So this is an area uh, I don't know because I was seeing this discussion going on. You asked this question, Michael responded wonderfully, and then Professor Kumar uh, immediately came back with that other observation. So I could not resist myself uh, from saying all this because we have just knocked the door. Yeah. The knocked the door. What exactly is Sanskrit? It's not a language. It is. It is actually a system of languages. When all these languages and vibration they converge and become an ensemble, ensemble, they form a vibration system that we call Sanskrit. So our rishis had actually reached that level. The whole of Raj Yoga, uh, of which Michael is an initiate, is essentially this, where they discover, they uncoil, they uncoil the latent power of the knowledge of the universe, which is already there inside you, which otherwise we see it outside. We think it's outside. But it's actually inside you. So I think, is there. Yeah. yeah, Panini is there. Bhatrihari is there. The whole of Bhatrihari and Panini is actually based on that. So all we have to do is make this connections. You know, Sanskrit is pursued as one body of knowledge. Electrical sciences is pursued as another body of knowledge. Our architecture is pursued as a third body of knowledge. Maybe one day uh, we'll come where these these things. Maybe ten years, twenty years later. When at least I am not there in IIT Kharagpur, some some <laughs> scholar, some scholar in IKS probably will do this. The human body is the best example. Yeah, of the human everything. body All is sciences. actually a, the human body is actually a huge, huge mystery. Huge, huge yeah. mystery. Yeah. Uh, we have just tapped two or three true. percent of the human body so far. True, true. Yeah, yeah. Nandini has joined there. Nandini, yeah. Yep. Yeah, Nandini, hello. Yeah. So Michael, this is another of our hello. scholar. She's from the background and she was all there. So Nandini, you may say a few words. Any Hello, sir. Good, good afternoon. Yeah, it was really nice listening to you. Thank you. Yeah. So she's working with us. So they, they, are the, they are the future, they're the first batch of mm. Indian knowledge system. Uh, so a lot of, uh, lot, of as, lot of aspiration, a lot of good work, a uh, lot of good aspiration is actually in their hands. Anurag, Bulton, Bulton. 
is he still around? Or he was there almost. I think he just left, or maybe he's still there. I think he just left. He was all the all through. Dipanjan is also there. Dipanjan, are you around? I think he has also left. Okay, he was there till about five minutes back. So fine. So, so I think we have done. We had a very interesting. Uh, I think deliberation. Yeah, it's very good. Very, very interesting, very, very rich, Thank you. very profound. And it connected so many relatively less connected dots of human knowledge systems. So that was the gift that we had from Michael Karashevich today. I think uh, the Thank school, you. the Center of Excellence for Indian Knowledge System, IIT Kharagpur, will be actually, uh, yeah, be actually indebted to you one day a day will come when the fruits of your aspiration, Michael, will become a tree. Will yes. Become a tree. Hopefully. And it will it will give rise to more fruits and the future trees. And yeah, they'll all come down and make more seeds, and then be yeah, a, yeah, and, be a and whole then a crowd. Garden, and then with, a garden, an aranyak, a brihat aranyak will be created. Brihat you know. aranyak. And the Upanishad will be rewritten. The brihat aranyak Upanishad will be again rewritten. Yeah. The forest. The forest of knowledge. So that is beautiful. Thank you. So I think we had a very successful time. So because we are heading for the next module, which starts from five. It starts from five. Okay. Yeah, it starts from five, which is a talk by Professor Ganti Prashad Rao, one of our former professors. And he comes from the other side, from uh, systems knowledge, control systems with deep knowledge in mathematics and also electrical engineering. And uh, for a long time, he has been associated with uh, Indian knowledge system. And he is also the supervisor of some of my batchmates, you know, some of my batchmates. Oh. So he's a, he's a pretty aged person. So till, yeah, till now we are- in, till 80 now, years, I think. He's 80 yeah, yeah, years exactly. now. Till 80 now years. We, yeah, till now we are in the fatherly generation. Now we are going to step in the grandfatherly generation. Next session. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Michael. It was thank you. That was thank a great you. opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay. So we'll rejoin at about five, ten to five or something. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Vidu. Yeah, we'll rejoin. Yeah. Or uh, we can keep this on because it's we don't have much time. Yeah. So and I can talk with Vidu for some other things we can discuss. So we'll rejoin about 10 to 5, 10 to 5. Officer Mukhopadha has also joined. Also yes, sir. Pranam. <laughs> Rajeshay.